Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And by George, we really have a show today. As you know, this issue, besides the coronavirus aspect of it, is the issues and in, in the rate, you know, do you expect the, the, the writing and anything else and whatever in Minneapolis, Minnesota? We've got a real serious situation over there. A gentleman by the name of George Floyd, if you haven't heard or haven't seen, a video was shown where a policeman there was basically had a knee on his on his on his neck and whatever. I mean, I can go beyond and beyond, but, but the fact of the matter is there are a number of videos out there. And if you have an opportunity to access a laptop or even a, a, on your phone, if you have one, whatever, you can deal with that. I mean, I realize that a number of people now, some are just kind of like saying, well, he was, I'm going to just riot or whatever, because people are getting in the street there. It's really happening over there. And it's happening right now as we speak. And the other major, major media, CNN and Fox, I'm basically covering this issue also, big time. Sean Hannity has been doing a recap, like he's on now. He's been doing it for the last two or three days. This, thing, this issue happened on Monday. It happened on Monday. And you can teach us some similarities and some other issues. But no do it, folks. The, the issue we're talking about is the whole issue of race. No one wants to talk about race. No one wants to talk about race. The majority community, in most cases, they just don't believe it. And so my point is that for the benefit and the welfare of this country, we are going to have to have that discussion. And because of this issue, because of this issue, this person should not die in vain. In all due respect, have, have died in vain. The point is that we've got to talk about the issue of race. And we are right in the midst of a campaign for president of these United States. That's the major, major piece. And we've got to divide here. We've got the Republicans on one side and the Democrats on the other side, so to speak. We got to divide. Again, it almost sounds like the Civil War, the North against the South routine. Here, Civil War, local war aspect of it. Well, guess what? We've got to come out of this. We've got to work together to get that. We've got to communicate with one another. So, so, so quotes and whatever that might be said right now, I hear it. I hear it. I've heard it. I've been around it the whole nine yards. But having the opportunity to be on 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 P, on TV on on cable, on radio, and background-wise, and just recently ran for mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon. I mean, I'm out there with the public, and I have to identify with everybody in many ways. So, so the bottom line, stick with us. This good stuff show is not going to be just today and just tonight. The fact of the matter is we're going to have a series. We're going to discuss this issue as long as we can to make sure that we get people on board to be able, so they can communicate and give them the time to communicate. So joining me for the first show this time around, and we're gonna have more of these shows on this on this area. This area, gentleman by the name of Fred Stewart. Stewart, he's here. Uh, and like I said, you might by the way, you might notice some technical difficulties right now. Maybe echo or this, that, and other. But stick with us because um, we, we, we're right in front. We're on Zoom. Zoom is um, kind of like a public kind of deal, and everybody's on Zoom right now as we speak. Okay, but anyway, we're gonna have this show. I've got Fred Stewart, who's a local community person. He's a realtor by trade, aspect of it, but he's very, very active in community issues, city issues, state issues, and the like. And I thought it would be neat to have him here. Plus the fact he's a he's a he's a former Marine, he's a Marine today. Just like myself. I'm I'm a Marine myself also too. And whatever you want how you want to class it, but the fact classify that. But the fact of the matter is is that he gets involved. He knows it across the board. And I will say right up front with you, at this state of the game right now, because of this political action, you know, I'm, excuse me, Bridge, John, if you want to call me conservative, you want to call me liberal at times, the fact of the matter is I'm a U.S. citizen and I fought for my country. I, I spent the time, I've built some stuff, I've done some things. Hey, I have a resume. You can Google my name. There might be six or seven Bruce Broussards out there <laughs> because there's a lot of hacking going on, big time, okay? But just this one, and just straight away, you'll see me. Fred, are you there? Are you there, Fred? Yes, I am here, Bruce. Fine, fine, fine. So why don't we just open up the show and, and uh, give them a little, just a little background about yourself because 
this is going national and people need to know who you are and uh, why are you at the table and I, I, I know why you're at the table just share a little part yeah. go on so well, Bruce you know I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a regular guy from Portland Oregon just like you love my country love my family you know and uh, I just want a good discussion about what's going on around us today. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds great, sounds great. Well, Fred, like you, I mean, we're, we're definitely into the news and, and what's going on in the activities. I'm sure you heard about the whole issue in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis Minnesota. And uh, what was your, your immediate take when you saw that video of, uh, of, the, of the arrest of the African American there in Minnesota? In Minneapolis, I'm sorry. Go on. Well, what was your immediate reaction to that video? Well, you know, Bruce, like like most people, you know, I was offended. I was pissed off. I hate what I saw. I literally watched a police officer murder someone almost a smirking way right in front of the people. Like it didn't matter. You know, I mean, it reminded me of things that I heard about, I mean, Bruce, I'm, you know, of course I'm younger than you. There's certain, I mean, I, I experienced racism like you all my life, but not, you've seen stuff that I've never seen. And for a lot of Americans, black and white, what they were witnessing there, what they were watching there yep. was something that, you know, a lot of us have only heard about, you know, about the brazenness of just snuffing out a life, you know what I mean? For no reason. And you know the only reason there could have been was race. You know, you know that the only reason this guy, this cop treated this black guy the way he did was because he feels black people are, you know, not worthy of his respect in one way or the other. And the, I think that's what Americans and people around the world are reacting to. It was so blatant. Not that we haven't seen other examples, but this one, Watching the entire event, and it was slow. It's mm -hmm. 10 minutes long. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like Chinese water torture. And every second, those, those images are being embedded into this, you know, the lives of everybody who watched it. You, can't, you cannot be the same person after you watch it that you were before you watched it. Mm -hmm. You just can't be the same, even if you're black. It's horrible. I mean, I was watching something that I only heard from my, my mother and father. Things that I only heard from my grandparents and great-grandparents. You know what I mean? Right. It's right there in front of you. Right there. And the difference is now a lot of white people have seen it. They see how ugly it is. It's not that they didn't know it was ugly before. They just never seen it so raw. You know what I'm Just raw. It's going to be a while before things become normal again in this area. Okay. I might, I might add again, too, folks, that we may be, we may be receiving a little technical, little, uh, technical, a little difficult aspect of it. But bear with us. Again, like I said, everybody, in all due respect, is getting on, uh, on, on vehicles that, that are sharing and talking about this, uh, this issue right now as we're, as we're doing this show right now. So, with all due respect, yeah. if you want to access that bill, if you have a phone or have access to a computer, whatever, then you can Google it. You can Google the person's name. And it's George Floyd. You can do George Floyd, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And with all due respect, you'll get all kinds of background material. So, uh, again, like I said, that will help you understand where, again, where Fred is coming from. Where I am. I would ditto everything he said. All due respect. And you, and you got to remember, we're already in a major, major crisis now. We've been told about distance and this and that other on this coronavirus situation. It's a very serious situation. But now, all of a sudden, race, race tops it far better than that. You notice the people that are in the streets today. There was no, there's no distancing or nothing of that being discussed. Many of those folks, as you see, are not familiar with the, the whole issue of distance and this, that, and other. Or better yet, they're not even there yet. They've still been trying to be motivated to understand the seriousness of this deal. We got a we got a crisis there. 
Now let me add, let me throw some things on the table, Fred, and I'd like for you to react and just we'll just add on back and forth, you and I. Uh, the bottom line is that, for instance, we do have a president of these United States. His name is Donald Trump. But in all due respect, because of this divide routine aspect of it, there's no respect on one side of the spectrum. And on the other side of the spectrum, there's all respect. So the name of the game is that on this particular issue about the issue with the, uh, the, the, the so-called uh, uh, police issue aspect of it, he immediately jumped up and made a point to get the, get, get the attorney general on, big time, mm -hmm. on this issue. The FBI and everybody else along that particular line and said, get there and, and, and get this thing resolved immediately. Find out who, catch the person, buy all, anything or whatever. Deal with this issue. And he felt just as strong about some of the issues positions that others have were taken about the fact that he did not like this. That's the president of the United States. But even then, even then, people would deny it on the other side. That's a fact. But the fact of the matter is we got to have some sense. We got a system here. And I realize R is, is big. So we're going to have to have this discussion on the whole issue of race, which is part of this, which is part of this campaign in a big time. But police issue, that's going to have to be discussed big time. And both Fred and I, we, we, we know officers. We, we dealt with, I've, dealt, I've dealt with it from a, from a journalistic standpoint as a Marine recruiter when I came here to Portland, Oregon. I've dealt with it with issues. And Fred was the same when I make the point about the possible incident. I was right at the lead of this whole piece and, and led a peaceful march downtown Portland. And it's still an issue today. They still is an issue today, and that was wrong, and police did wrong, and no, nothing, nothing happened about that piece, and I'm still looking to go to recall, and hold a kind of a, a talk, if you will, among police, part of the training, and educate them about what actually happened, on, on what had happened there in the black community. It was huge. It's still huge. It's still current today. And many of the officers in the old time still don't believe. They think it was by light. it was a responsibility and the problem of the blacks. The black united front of this and this. No. I, 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 Fred and I are gonna do a piece on that. Because once you hear the story, once you hear the whole facts, the facts, facts. You ask yourself the question, you gotta be kidding me. They did that to this black. And call and Bruce? call the thief. So anyway, I, I'm giving you that piece, and I'm gonna let Fred come in and say his piece a minute or two, and then I'll shift, we'll shift, shift it again. Go on, Fred. Hey, what do you got? Hey, Bruce. Talk can you. you hear me? Yes. Go on. Bruce. Um, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, but one of the things talking about what's going on today and how things are reacting today is you know, last week we had a prominent white politician who, by the way, has put over a million black people in prison, Joe Biden. Okay. And you know, even in 2008, I didn't understand why he was Barack Obama's vice president pick. I mean, I, I, it's, I mean Joe Biden and, and Bill Clinton literally put a million black people in prison, and they knew they were going to do that. How is the, how does that mean? Define that. What do you mean by that? Well, when they expanded the, the war on drugs in 1994, they were told by many people, black and white people, experts from all over the country, what they were doing, the effect, the unequal effect it was going to have on the black population. And they didn't care. They did it anyway. But what I'm getting to is last week, I don't want to get into that far back, you know, last week, Joe Biden said, hey, Negroes, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Yeah. You know? And then we go into this week where a liberal, a Democrat, hardcore Democrat, liberal white woman, when a black person annoyed her, she decided to try to kill him by cop. She knows. They said on her Facebook, she has posted in the past about other situations where cops have killed other black people. So she's a white woman, that's what they call woke. She knew what the consequences could be. So what does she do? A black guy annoys her, she gives him the phone, calls 911, lies, and says, hey, a black guy is threatening me. 
And then she starts acting like she's crying, that she's scared, and everything. Trying to build attention so that yep. these cops, mostly white, mostly white, but even the black ones, would rush to her rescue mm -hmm. and come and save her from this mean, nasty black guy. You get my meaning? She fed into the stereotype. She pulled that card out of the deck. What black people and white people are noticing is that racism, like you and I have talked about, Bruce, it never leaves the lives of a black person. And mm -hmm. even some of our white friends who aren't racist, the way they approach us is, hey, if I get tired of this Negro, I'm going to pull out my race card. I'm yep. going to go racist on them. It's, it's like it's a tool. It's like it's a weapon that's holstered until you piss them off or until you disappoint them. And we saw that. Well, now... Look at what happened on Monday. This black man is arrested and literally killed, murdered in front of all of us, brazenly, brazenly. And a little Vietnamese guy, a ocean guy, just in there, let it happen. Hey, it's him, not me. You know, today is the black guy getting killed. Tomorrow, I mean, the Laotian guy ain't thinking is he could be next. Yep. Yep. You know, he could be next. But that's how racism goes in our country. People look out for themselves. A lot of white people who are against racism don't say nothing about it when they see it happen because they're only looking out for themselves. And I am hoping that this is a tipping point. That this is the people looking out for their community, not just looking out for themselves. Because racism is a threat to the community. It's, a divide. it's the ultimate divider in our country. It is even more powerful than money. It is yep. more powerful than gold. Racism. Yep. It is divided and it is killed. Like I said on my Facebook earlier today, racism kills black people every day. It may not be by a gun, but a lot of times it is. But just the mere fact that racism has had a massive economic impact on black America. A massive economic impact. On black it's not, and it's not okay. over yet. It's not over yet. And it's not over with yet. It's still, it's still, I mean, things are getting better, Bruce. You and I are doing better than our fathers and our grandfathers. But look at the pace. The divide between white and black is not getting shorter. It's increasing. Because we have not nipped this issue in the bud. Yep. You understand what I'm talking about? We have not nipped this issue in the bud. And until we do... We're going to have this divide. That's why I jokingly joke about having gladiator fights with racist people, having racist white people face each other in a, in, you know, in a, in a Roman-style setting. They let them fight to the death. You know what I mean? I just yep. tell people, when are we going to finally get tired of this distraction? And that's what racism is. When are we going to get tired of this encumbrance on our liberties? which is what racism is. Now, keep in mind, guys, I'm not talking about bigotry. We live in a free country. In your mind, you can be as bigoted as you want. Where it becomes wrong is where your bigotry motivates you to take action or to do something, whether it be simply intimidating a black person to killing and everything in between, everything in between. You know, Bruce, one of the most fascinating things that, uh, Frederick Douglass, the last meeting he had with, with uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think it was either the day he was killed or the day before he was killed. He asked Frederick Douglass what could he do, what could the United States do to help black people? What was the most important thing to do to help the slaves? Other than give them 40 acres basically in a mule. He agreed with that. You know what Frederick Douglass said? Stay out of the way. Don't encumber black people. Don't tread on their liberty. You don't have to do anything else. Black people are Americans just like everybody else. And they will find a way. That's basically what he said, Bruce. Mm. Racism, you're in the way. Racist people get in the way. That is what they do. They get in the way. They tread on the liberties and justice for other people, namely black people. Mm -hmm. They are a distraction that nobody deserves. Because think about it. If you're white 
and you're against racism, he kind of stuck and help a black person out. That's a distraction. If you're black and you're dealing with a, a, a racist person, you got to get them out of the way or find a way to get around them. Yep. We don't deserve that. Nobody does in our country, white or black. Don't deserve it. And you know what good Americans do to people who are a threat to our liberty? We eliminate those people. We confront those people. We've done it since the revolution. Why not do it with these people who are racist in our country? Like I say on my Facebook, you know things are getting better when black people and white people start hunting down racist white people like grizzly bears. Because they are a threat to us all. You don't have to be black for the destructive nature of a racist white person to affect you. It's affecting the property owners in Minnesota right now. It's affecting the insurance companies. It's affecting the people who have to go to work tomorrow in Minnesota right now, and not all of them are black. Because of one racist white cop decided to kill a black man, look how much damage and look how much it's costing that community. Is the life of one racist white person worth it? Is it? We spend billions murdering people overseas who are a threat to our liberties. And I'm all for that. Just like you are, Bruce, we're Marines. We joined the Marines to go face those people, right. go face those enemies of our Constitution, to go face those people who are against our way of life. Why are we doing that here in this country? Racist white people are a threat to us all. Whether you are black or white, they affect us all, every one of us. So I think we're just seeing the beginning of what I hope is a positive path that this country's on. Right. We need and to end this divide today let's as soon as possible, at the very least. Let, let, let's toss out a couple of pieces, just following up in terms of what you're saying in regards to when I, when I first approached this piece, because I knew we were going to be doing this. And in that way, I was uh, on the public page aspect of it. So what I did, when someone posted, when someone posted that photo of the president, that, that piece has been, when I posted it, it was very interesting how people reacted to that. They reacted to it big time, constantly. This is you, you didn't fact chase, you didn't fact check it, and all this, this, that, and the other. And I said to myself, "Well, now wait a minute." And I knew this. Okay, I knew. It was fake. I posted it, but then I said to myself, "Why would it allowed to be posted?" Facebook should have caught that. They've got the technology, and that's that's part of that whole deal. I mean, I mean, they've got the technology. Why did they post that particular photo? Now it didn't come from someone. Else. It came from someone that I knew, but someone that I knew was liberal, and he was a Democrat in many ways, and because of whatever his views is, and and, and that's the that's the freedom of speech and this that, and the other. He had all the right to do what, say what he wanted to say. But he said it because of the political piece. So then I post it, and then all of a sudden it's, as you know, what I normally do, I just said, okay, fine, uh, please comment and sh share and comment. But everybody that responded said, this is your photo, Bruce. <laughs> this is your photo. I, I didn't, I didn't re react to that right off the bat. I just allowed them to basically take it and run with it. And they did run with it. But then after I, after I went through that deal and everybody else was basically jumping, I said, okay, fine. And then I posted, it is fake. And then I said, but what about this photo and video? I didn't get the response. They went back to the first photo about how, how I was a communist and all this kind of weird stuff. You know, it doesn't affect me. It was, this is not me. It's the post. I didn't, I didn't post. I wasn't the original. I wasn't the original. So, so, so I'm throwing that out to say, again, here we go again. We got to fix that. And I'm just saying, as I look at the whole deal, Facebook's going to have to pick it up. They're going to have to pick up the tab. Pick up the tab. I mean, we get more sex from women. <laughs> you know, you get hacked any day of the week, right? You got me? Constantly. Should that be on there? But the bottom line, this particular piece, though, should not have been on there. Then the thing is, I, I didn't say, well, okay, fine. You need to find, identify the person, and then I and then hopefully take him 
and and, and that person could be, uh, be 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 censored or whatever, and maybe charged with with whatever instigating a riot of some sort, arrest him or whatever, fine him or anything. But the fact of the matter is, it, depending on who who did it, could have been black, could have been white. Some say more white than black. Could have been Mexican. Could have been Asian. Could have been a political <laughs> elected official. At the point. But the fact of the matter is, is that <laughs> but, but Bruce, we, we don't we don't want the truth. We don't want but, but Bruce, you, you have to understand something. Um, I don't like using words like woke. I don't I don't believe in that stuff. But I think a lot of people today because of that video and because of what I like I said before, the setup, the, the things that happened before it. I mean, this goes all the way back to you know, Trayvon Martin. You know, every couple of months, something like this happens. It right. seems to only get worse. Right. Right. And the, you're talking about a nearly 10-year period of time that a lot of the social media have been educated. It's kind of like what um, Bill Smith said, or at least a quote that was attributed to him, was that there's just as much racism today as there's always been. The difference is there are cameras now on cell phones. You know, that's the difference. Is now you're able to show it. You know, like I told people, if there, if there had not been a camera filming what we saw on Monday, right? that cop would have denied it ever happened. Right. And so were the other three cops that were that's with That's right. They all that's would have right. denied. They were cops, especially a white cop. They would have given right. the benefit of the doubt. Right. If there hadn't been a camera uh, right. this weekend when that white woman claimed that a black guy had threatened her life, right. We would have believed her. A lot of black people would have believed her. You giving me, uh, you know, they would have said, oh, this black guy, he's a threat to my life, and I felt scared. You know, a lot of people would have been pissed. They would have said, hey, black dude, gay black dude, why are you out intimidating white women? You know what I mean? And right. he, he would have had yeah. hell to pay. Right. You know? So, no, people now, because of cameras, are being educated about what's going on. And what has been going on throughout your life, Bruce? And, I, and Bruce, you you got stories that are better or worse than mine. Oh, just hey. like my mom, just like my dad. I tell yeah. people, Big you time. know why I haven't gone crazy and gone out and murdered a bunch of racist white people? Because whenever that urge comes up, I think of a story that somebody older than me that's black told me. And they're always worse. They always make whatever racism I just dealt with, because I haven't been killed, of course. It makes it look small. You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, yeah, I hate what this guy did. I hate what this girl did. But then I think of people like you, Bruce. I think of people like my grandparents and my grandparents and other old. And I think of the stories that they've shared and you shared. I'm like, okay, what I just went through isn't that bad. They didn't kill anybody. You know what I mean? It's like people understand this is something that is passed down to generation. Yep. You know your great great grandfather dealt with it. Your yep. grandfather dealt with it. Your great, your it's just like, like tell people, it's always it's omnipresent. It's omnipresent and it's a distraction. And I, I can understand when you're white and you don't have to deal with it, you don't want to hear about it, you know, let alone do anything about it. Hey, I don't want to, you know, make great drama into my life. I don't want to deal with it because racist people bring the drama in. No way to defeat them is hard. Yep. You know, there's no such sort of thing as a light touch on a racist. When you have to deal with a racist person, you got to deal with them hard. That's just how it goes. You know what I mean? And of course, white people don't want to jump in. You know, they have their own lives to deal with. But, you know, when they saw this video and they saw, you know, this guy die and when they saw the pea stream going down toward the curb, we yep. all know what happened, what that meant. The guy's gone, and you just watched the taking of a life. You just watched this cop. He didn't shoot him, right? He literally snuffed the life in front of us. The whole world. This guy. The whole, in the whole of the, world. The whole world. The whole world. I mean, there are going to be people, black and white, that got PTSD out of the video. Yep. You understand? I mean, it's going to be it's a traumatic event in American history. That's and we should and Fred, illustrate I would, what black people have been dealing with all along. Right. 
let, let me add again what exactly what Fred's coming. Everybody should be given the opportunity to watch that video. Everybody should be shown in the classroom. In the classroom. It should be shown on the, on the two. All, I mean, all, all shows, just like they normally do when the president comes on, they focus on his speech. This video should be done the same way. That's the start. Let them see it. Let them see it. Let the, let the, let, let the so-called news media comment on it and write about it. Because in all due respect, when I saw CNN and Fox, I thought they were the same, they, they were the same network. Sean Hannity, as you know, is a lead proponent and a supporter of the Trump administration. But, but trust me, he had the same feeling that Don Lemon had on CNN and Chris Como, same feelings. So my point, that to me is a good start. That's another reason why we're, we're doing the show now on this piece and we're gonna follow it up. We're gonna help you through this, this jungle, if you will, because we do have background. I can say this point blank, my time in the Marine Corps taught me a lot of stuff. But it said one thing to me. I'm a U.S. citizen. Well, look here. What we're going to do, we're going to take a short break. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Bertard, your host, and part of my guest host, and I'll do is make do on the side boy, as we get by the name of Fred Stewart. And what we've been doing for the last 30 minutes or so, the first part of the show, we've been discussing the issue that's existing right now in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I mean, many of Minnesota, by the way. The bottom line is that that was this issue with reference to police and African Americans, and it's huge. But then that's from the national perspective. And then but it impacts everybody around the country. But in all due respect, what we're gonna do this particular segment by another, th by another 25 minutes, we're gonna bring it home here in Portland, Oregon. And we're gonna see how this it can associate, how it associates with us, how it identifies with us, and what can we do about it? And what has been our track record as it relates to racism and i.e. and the police situation here in the Portland metropolitan area? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Fred is there on the other end. And so we'll, again, we'll just start right off the bat. Uh, he, might, he might be the youngest of the two, but in all due respect, in all due respect and as a result of that, he's been here the longest. You got me? And I'd yeah. like to start with him from the standpoint of saying, okay, Fred, you know, you've been here the longest. You've you grew up here in the whole nine yard aspect of it. And um, and I know what, what your relationships are. And a lot of people who are going to be watching the show this time around are going to be local folks because we're going to be talking to them. And we want them to understand that they, they, they've got to get they got to get in this lane, too. We've got to discuss this issue of race and police straight up. We've got to and we have the opportunity because if police is involved, that is one of the major issues that we have still here around the country, but we have in Portland, Oregon also, okay? So that's what we're going to be doing. And so, Fred, why don't you just go on and begin and give us a little history about uh, your, your, your relationship here as far as community and the whole issue of race and police since you've been here. Well, one thing I want to share with you, and you probably think take this as very interesting. Um, I, I can't nail down yet, and I will later for you, Bruce, the exact year the first black Portland police officer was was hired. It was, if my memory is correct, it was either in the mid to late twenties or early thirties. So we're coming up on a hundred years. We're near a hundred years of having a black person in uniform and a badge and a gun here in Portland, Oregon. Um, one of the first Multnomah County Sheriff's uh, deputies was black, and he was murdered um, on the in the line of duty. I think in the late eighteen nineties. There's a photo of him down at the Justice Center in downtown Portland. So we've had black people in law enforcement in Oregon longer than most states in this country. Believe it or not, it's true. So what I'm getting to is this. In the history of law enforcement in Oregon, black people have served in law enforcement departments all over the state of Oregon over the last, let's say, 90 years, 90 plus years. No black law enforcement officer has ever killed anybody. Nobody white, nobody black. And we've had thousands of black people in law enforcement in Oregon over the years. So the question I ask a lot of people is, does that mean black people are less or not as good in law enforcement as white people? Because we've got a lot of white guys that have killed a lot of people, black and white, 
a lot. How is it possible? And I mean, Oregon's not the most racist state. We got a bunch of idiots that try to paint Oregon as, you know, like Mississippi. Nothing is like Mississippi. If you, the only people who feel right. Oregon is like Mississippi are people who have never been there or people who are just dishonest. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? But yeah, we've had our racism in Oregon. We have. How come in the entire history of Oregon, no black, it seems, no black law enforcement officer has not just not killed any black people, they've not killed any white people. They've not killed anybody. How did they do their jobs? Have entire careers enforcing the law, protecting and serving on the street, and somehow not shoot anybody. You know, I mean, that is a very interesting piece of history for me. Let me throw something on the table for you on that piece of history. What if, what if I were to say to you that they, weren't, they knew that they weren't allowed to shoot anybody, especially white folks, okay? And then indirectly, they have been around areas that, that black folks have been shot, and killed and murdered, if you will, to a certain degree, by, let's say, white officers. Not, not, I'm not talking about the majority. Well, well Bruce, I, I, and I hear you. Are you seeing where I, I'm going I, with I this piece? I see where you're going, but you see, that's, Talk about that. Talk that about still it. Doesn't, that still doesn't address the issue <clears throat> of the one-on-one -on -one contact that law enforcement officers that were black have had over the years. I hear what you're saying, and what you're saying is right. But when a police officer gets a call, they don't know who's there. And most times, especially over the last 30 years or so, the, the, the dispatcher can't say, I'm not going to send this police officer there because he's black. They throw out the call, and the police officer says, I'm near, and they go. Get my meaning? So mm -hmm. if you look at the random theoryness of it, if you understand how random theory works mathematically, black, people, black police officers have been in situations that were life-threatening. And they found a way to enforce the law without killing somebody. Well, I'm agreeing with that. But I'm that, talking about that other. Do what you're talking about with a black person being told, you better not put, shoot that white guy. You no, better I didn't, say, I didn't say it that way. I don't care. I was a Marine, and you were. Yeah. The U.S. Marines could have said, Fred, don't shoot anybody white. We're in Europe. And I'm going to tell you, if I thought I was about ready to get smoked by somebody white, I'm ignoring that order. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and anybody would. Bruce, all of these black guys. Well, me too. I mean, it you had a problem with you. That their boss said, hey, uh, don't shoot white people. If he gets a call to a robbery or domestic violence or whatever, pull somebody over because of a traffic stop, and that person felt their life was at, in danger and they needed to pull a gun and shoot somebody, they were going to, Bruce. Nobody is going to die even black people, Bruce, because some white guy told him to, you know, take a bullet. That doesn't happen, Bruce. No. Well, be fair. Be fair now. You, we, were, we both went through boot camp. And you know, in the Marine Corps, they don't, they don't say you have to sign a contract. Well, you no, what I'm trying to say, Bruce, is <laughs> what I think is interesting is how did these black police officers, and we're talking now black people in the thousands now. We're not talking about this. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a whole different ball game now. You know? how, did, how does a black police officer in Oregon figure out how to do their job and the, com and the complexities and the dangers and the threats that face everybody in law enforcement? How have they figured out how to do it without you know, killing anybody? How, how does that happen? Especially in Portland. Bruce, we're talking Portland, Oregon here. Right. How did Harry Jackson clean up MLK without shooting a pimp? <laughs> without without shooting any of the Johns that he pissed off. How in the world did he – he was a state – how does a state trooper – State police, yeah. Black state troopers. How does a state trooper out in the middle of nowhere, out in Medford – we've had black state troopers <laughs> in Medford. How did they pull white people over for traffic stops and God knows what else, do their job, enforce the law, and guess what? Never shoot anybody. You know, I think it's something that everybody who's thinking about this issue should think about. We've never seen a black person do what we saw that white guy do in Minnesota. It's not in Oregon. Right. right. You know, why? Is it because the white guy cops are so good? 
and the black guys are bad, black cops are bad, is it, is it, are you a good cop if you're not quick to shoot somebody? You know what I'm saying? I talk about the shootings that we've had, that, you, that you're familiar with, that we've had here in the Portland metropolitan area. Well, we had a couple of, you know, righteous ones. I mean, there, there was this one, the Otis one, where he shot a, guy, a, a cop, you know, in his leg. Of course, you shoot a cop, you're going to get shot. No, I'm, I'm not. I understand it. Let's talk about. There has been some horrific kinds of situations here. Oh yeah, I mean we've had our our bad shootings. You know the one that happened over there on uh, Broadway, um, and uh, just off of MLK th that happened back in the '90s that ended up with that controversy over "Don't choke him," you know, smoke him. That whole thing. Uh, yeah, where Stevens. The cop, and he was, Stevens. You talking about Stevens? And he Stevens, was a marine. Stevens. He that was a was marine. Straight up murder. They that was him. straight yeah. up murder. Yeah. This yeah. white yeah. cop. This white cop got pissed off that he had pissed off a black guy because when they got there, the black guy was the peacemaker. That's he, right. He protected, he, he protected the clerk at the 7-Eleven. Yes, who he did. attacked by this white guy. This racist white guy got pissed. You know, and white guys that are racist do that sometimes. They get mad that a black guy is mad. Yeah. yeah. You understand? Know Especially yeah. when they offend us. A white guy will offend a black guy, will do something, talk about their wives, talk about their mothers, whatever. And if a black guy gets mad, the black guy, I mean, the white guy loses. it. The white guy's like, how dare this Negro get mad? Well, that's what, what happened gun in this situation. So what ha this happened to this black guy twice. He ends up getting in a fight with this white guy who tried to jump on this clerk. I think this clerk was a woman. He, you know, so he's defending a white woman uh, because this white guy is an asshole. And she calls the cops. The cops arrive. They walk right past the white guy, the, right. the, the offender, and they immediately attack the black guy. Well, who was holding? Who was holding the, the white guy? Yeah, exactly. So yep. the, the white woman there, the, the clerk pointed out that they made a mistake. That the black guy was uh, not the offender. The black guy was the you know basically the hero in this situation. And they you know they let him go. You know, the other cops let him go. But the sergeant, the guy that was in charge of the scene, got mad that the black guy for getting mad for being, you know, mischaracterized, for being stereotyped. And he ended up putting him in a chokehold. And he right. murdered him, just like right. what we saw in Minnesota. He got mad that the black guy got mad. It's one of the reasons to this day. The last thing a white guy wants to do is get mad. If I pick up, he's mad at me because I'm mad at him. Oh, <laughs> I just got madder. You get my meaning? Things yep. are going to get worse. You understand? He doesn't yep. want to go there with me. Yep. He, he better be mad at me for something I did or said. But if he's simply mad at me because I'm mad at him, oh, mm -hmm. we're going to tussle. Mm -hmm. We're going to mm -hmm. tussle. Oh, yeah. You understand? Oh, yeah. It doesn't they, matter know. what the issue was before. It's now, oh, you're mad because I'm mad? Well, damn. We're both mad now. But I'm definitely madder than you. Because I'm mad that you're mad that I'm mad. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what happened with Stevens. And it cost him his life. And so white police officers, they looked at it as just another call. Yep. They yep. looked at it as, hey, you know... You know, people get mad at us when we do our job because they're not sensitive to the racial overtones of the whole issue. You get what, about the, what about those individuals? Comes up with this, don't choke them, smoke them t-shirt. Right. Well, like I said, now, even to, to this day, Fred, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out to you. There are some officers who have retired and some that are still on that feels very comfortable about the position that the department had taken from the standpoint, hey, there was no crime there. Am I right? Well, after, today, after this week, they're going to be different. That's what I'm coming from. They'll be, they will be different elsewhere. Most of right. those guys you're talking about have moved on. They've retired. Right, right, right. They got their pension, and they've moved away. But they but should discuss this not in roll call. Like that in Portland right. because they don't want to be on the wrong side of history. I mean, cops aren't stupid. That's right. You know that's what I'm right. talking about? That's right. That's right. That was a straight-up murder. They killed well, that, 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 that cop killed that guy. Killed right. And by the way, he was a Marine. Yes, killed yes. Stevens and got away with it. Yep, and the only reason he got away with it is there's no video like we have today to prove what we, what we know happened. Well, let me share another little thought with you about that history. I was kind of like part of it too because Stan Peters was the president of the police union. 
Yeah. And I went to Stan. Again, he was a former Marine. Yeah. And I went to Stan and said, hey, Stan, you know, in all due respect, here's an opportunity to educate the public about uh, the different uh, jobs that police have and the severity and all this other, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And he agreed with me. And, from, and all of a sudden, and I was doing shows during that particular time. And he and I made arrangements where he came on. And the whole show was about educating the public about police work, that they were law enforcement officers, and these are the types of trials, and what is the flow. It wasn't their responsibility to call the shots. It was the people through the mayor's office. I mean, we, we went through that whole process, that whole piece. And then at times, a lot of folks didn't like Stan for coming on the show, educating it with me. And in fact, well, when you, know, you, you yeah. got a lot of problems going there, you know, racist people don't like being called out. Yeah, they yeah. don't. And then also, did it. you got people who aren't racist, who've got great lives. It's great to live in our community. You know, but again, like the drama. But, but they, you know I mean, we don't want the drama. I mean, we're telling a lot of white people to look at people that they love yeah. and confront them. And that's I mean, I can't get black people to confront the gang members in their family. <laughs> You know, I tell black people, you want to know how hard it is for a white person to confront the racist people in their life? When was the last time you, you know, you stomped the corn on the gang member in your family? When was the last time you allowed a gang member to come over for a barbecue? When was the last time you allowed a gang member to come to your church? When was the last time you allowed your child to talk to the mother or father of a gang member? You get my meaning? It's the same mm -hmm. thing for white people when it comes to racist. We got a lot of non-racist white people who truly are good people. They're not racist, majority, right? Majority, majority. But, but yeah, but they've got racist people in their family. Yes, how, yes. How do you confront somebody you love and say, hey, what you're doing is wrong? You understand? I tell black people, when you learn how to stomp a corn routinely on that black gang member in your family, then maybe you can share with your white friends and family, how to stump a corn on a racist white person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because they both are a threat to us. I mean, a black gang member, when I see a black gang member, I see a KKK hood. I don't see a, a, another black person that I need to reach out and touch and love. I'm looking at a black person I need to put a round in my chamber for. Just like I feel when I see a KKK -er or a Nazi a stormtrooper. You understand what I'm talking about? You know, it's hard for us to come down on those that we love when we know they're doing wrong sometimes. And sometimes we just don't want to go through the frustration, the drama. We don't want to go through the, the, the drama. We're being very selfish sometimes. And what I think people are beginning to learn or, or hopefully begin to learn that we, we've got to take that fight unless we want our grandchildren to deal with this. Okay. I tell my black friends, let, if let me, you let, want your grandchildren to me. deal with gang members, take them on today. If you don't want your grandchildren to deal with racist white people, take them on today. And I say that same thing to white people. If you want your children and grandchildren to grow up in a better world, us adults, us old folks right now, we got work to do That's today, right, right, right now. Because I don't know about you, Bruce, I'm, and I'm sure I got an idea. I don't want my grandchildren dealing with this crap. I don't. I don't want my great grandchildren dealing with this crap. I don't think you do either. That's why we're doing the show. That's why we're doing the show. That's why we say what we say and do what we do. Yeah, that's right. That's you right. Know, I'm hoping for a world that we all keep saying we dream of, where people are judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And that right. goes for black gang members too. That's right. I tell people, you know, black people, if you want to learn how to help fight racism, learn how to deal with these damn gang members. <laughs> you know, gang members have killed in just the last year, and we're not talking about going back to 1970, more black people than the highest estimate of how many black people were lynched between 19, I mean, 1870 and 1965. Just in the last year. And I'm, they've I'm done agreeing. that every year since 1970. <laughs> I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but that is another subject, Fred. Oh, no, no, it's another need, subject. We need to it's talk about subject. because, because I, I know that from my standpoint, I feel that there's a reason for it. Yeah, we just have to have that discussion because it well, bothers no, me there is as, a, a, as a Marine Ray, recruiter. Ray, yeah, because when I came here as a Marine recruiter, in all due respect, I focused on these young brothers. I did. Yeah, I yeah. focused on them.
give them the opportunity to get out of this swamp mentality piece. And to this day, when these, when these guys, some of these guys made it through the core, they come back and say, thank you, thank you, Sarge. They, they say, thank you, Gunny, I appreciate it, blah, blah, blah. I, uh, and that makes you feel good. So there is a solution to the problem. But no, no there is, Bruce, but Bruce, you also got to look at it this way. Your generation and the generation before faced 10 times more racism than these young men are facing today. And you guys did, there was murders in the black community back then. There, yep. there were, but not like today. Not that's like true. today. That's true. That's true. Uh, we've lost over 2 million young black people under the age of 25 just since 1990. I agree. To this black on black violence. Do you understand that? Do you know how many cities and towns that's po- that could have populated? It's just bullshit. No, you're right. It is a different issue. But what I'm getting to is I, 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 I'm using it, Bruce, to illustrate how hard it is to even fight racism because we're asking. Do you even talk about it? We're asking white people to do the same thing to the racist people and yep, their family. I, I understand. Well, Fred, that's why we're having this discussion. Very, mm-hmm. very important aspect of it. You know, and, and, I, and I'll make another statement very clearly. I'm not wearing this cover for nothing. No, I mean, paid, no. That's right. We, we paid our dues. You know, we paid our right. dues. You know, when, when, I, when we used to do the My Country Tears of Me, hey, this is, this is my country. <laughs> I want to make it very, very clear. The stars and stripes is my country. I fought for it. I paid yeah. my dues. I'm not going to, don't call me a minority. I'm a U.S. citizen. That's who yeah. I am. Now, in all due respect, I can't say that for a number of the folks who were subjected to all this other racism stuff. But I'm just saying to you, I'm at the table to see whether or not I could reach out. And that's what Fred and I are doing today. And yeah. in fact, the technician, is, in fact, Steve, who's out there trying, putting this show together for us. We're reaching out. This is serious stuff. No, you're right. We're all, we are reaching out, Bruce. Because and, I, and, I, and I might add, I might add on that particular note. I just ran for mayor of the city of Portland, and yeah. you know, in all due respect, they, I, I'm asking the question right now: Why weren't they talking about this and all those talk show hosts and all those folks that were interviewing folks who were running for office, talking about the issues that we were talking Bruce, about right because now? Because a lot of the people in right our now media, today, uh, hold it, Bruce. A lot of the people in our media are newspapers. Every major newspaper in Portland has racist white people running it. Every one. I know about their backgrounds, their colleges they went to. Some of them I know about their marriages, the girlfriends, boyfriends they've had. You know, after 2016, I got into their lives. And the one thing I tell all my friends, I said, guys, there's as many racist people in journalism in Portland, Oregon, as there are not racist people. Matter of fact, it's harder, it's harder to have a career in Portland, Oregon, in journalism, if you're if you're not white or if you're not racist, if you're a white person, and you're not racist. Then it is if you're straight up white and racist. Period. Matter of fact, David Duke about 20 years ago used to make a joke about the politicians and the um, and the people, the, the journalists here in Portland, Oregon. He said even the Jew ones, they're jealous. They they believe what I believe. They think like I think. They're just too cowardice to say it. You understand? <laughs> And he oh, said yeah. that because he said, it, it, the white supremacist movement has said this for years. The Northwest, especially Oregon, has a lot of white people who don't know how to be white. In other words, they have a lot of white people that don't think like them. <laughs> so yeah. they accuse those white people of not knowing how to be white. And they said that the media, the people in our journalism community, are afraid of those white people. They're afraid of those white people who don't know how to be white. Mm-hmm. You know, which I've always thought was hilarious, but it's true. The more I learn about the journalists in our market, the more I learn how racist they are. Mm-hmm. It's amazing the stuff that I've learned over the last four years. And well, still, well, and, you know, in all, in all, in all due respect, when you start talking about in this media, right? Just recently, we had Memorial Day. Yeah. Memorial Day. Yeah. Did you see any of the major newspapers? The newspapers, and I'm right up down the line: Oregonian, Willamette Week, the, the, the Tribune. The, what was the other one? Who's that other? Mercury or whatever? Yeah. Did you see a veteran's photo on the front page? No. <laughs> no. Of any of them. Any of no. them. Or, or even talk about the history of Memorial Day, which was started right. by black slaves. That's right. That's you know, right. They didn't talk about that. But they didn't talk about, you know, um, uh, you know, about veterans in general that much. I mean, they would show some photos of a flag and stuff, yep, 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 but they really yep. didn't dig into they didn't do you know, the, the value that veterans bring to the community. That's they right. don't talk about 
the veterans we've got that are in politics or in, or in sports or academia. They didn't talk about the fallen uh, veterans that we've got that are pretty inspirational people. And, and black veterans. Especially. And they didn't talk about minority veterans in general. No, I, I, I said black veterans. I know I, black I, veterans. I, I'm being very clear about this. I'm familiar with the Koreans and the Japanese and, and, and the, the Native, Native Americans. Americans. But it was the black, it was the black military right. who saved this right. country in Lincoln's well, time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, right down the line, that's pretty covered. Well, and think about said, it, Bruce. We Memorial had... Day, Memorial Day, just like you said, but it was a small quote, but I want to make sure they understand it. Memorial Day was something that blacks created. Exactly. Blacks and, created and the ceremony. And folks don't know that. Most, Google most it. Historians, if you say, get, get facts checked. Most historians point out that the first uh, person killed in the Revolutionary War was a black person. That's black. right. And then that's they right. also point out that the Army of the Potomac, many of those people who were with Washington when he crossed the Potomac were black people. They don't say that in the, in the history books and they don't point it out in the you know, in that photo, but the, the picture that was drawn. But a large percentage, I don't know what the percentage, but it was a large percentage of the guys that, <laughs> that were marching with Washington, fighting for this country, while black. there was slavery going on. That's right, we're black. We're black guys. We're black. Black. And black people, even with the issues that we've had throughout this country's history, right. have, have shown up um, and fought for the values of our country. That's right. Throughout that's the right. country. Throughout the that's history right. of the country. That's but right. no, but in general, you know, that's the kind of people we allow, that we, that we patronize, that we listen to, that we do advertising with, are newspaper people who do not share the general val val uh, values of the people who live here. I tell people most of the people in our journalism community are trying to, to change the values of the average Portlander, change the values of the average Oregonian by limiting and controlling to a huge degree the information that's presented to us. That's why, thank God for Twitter, thank God for Facebook, thank right, God right, for right. all of the social media. Because that's the history book. That's the history book right now, buddy. <laughs> yeah, where will we be? I mean, think right. about it. If that right. video had come out without social media, oh my God. years ago, or even 25 years ago, yes. there's a good chance we would have not seen it for years. That's right. That's right. For That's years. Right. But because yeah. of social media, That's right. it came out. Well, Fred, look, I'll tell you what, that's the intro of what we're going to be trying to do. And hopefully you're going to be prepared to come here next time. Around. We're going to bring in another guest, if you will. No. To add to the, add to the perspective. And we're going to stay on this subject matter because it's an opportunity, if you will, to deal with the issue of racism that impacts this country. And we're gonna to have to be together if we're gonna save it and spend these, spend these last few years, good years, okay? Just let me know, you know, any time. I mean, I, you know, I believe we need to keep talking about it. The only- We're gonna talk about it. The only way to defeat racism is for us to self-educate each other. Exactly. We gotta talk exactly. about it. Exactly. We Jeremy, gotta be ready for the ugly stuff. Sounds great. On that note, uh, I just want to thank again the viewing artists. Share the share the share this show with everybody. You can Google it. It's on Facebook. Some of you can't afford Comcast, but it's on Facebook. Go to your neighbors if they got a tube, a TV, or something like that. In fact, you can give them a call if you like to. Fred, they can give you a call, right? You know, yeah. His, 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 his my number five zero three seven zero one zero four five seven. Call me. Your number. My number is five zero three two eight nine forty nine seventy. And and by the way, it's across the board too. Anybody can call. As yeah, long as you yeah. want to talk about solving this problem. Well, Again, have talk it. about anything. Talk about solving right. this problem. Talk about real estate. I don't Sounds know. great. I hear that. Both. Sure. Okay. On that particular note, you already sold me a piece now. Okay. All right. Call it. Call it. Talk it. to you later, Bruce. All right. Take care now. And have a good one, folks. Back to what you believe in. I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.